Hi, folks. So we'll be starting the free AIML masterclass in a few minutes. Uh, so we're just waiting for folks to join in. Meanwhile, would love to know where you're joining from. I'm Rasha Khan. I'm your host for today's webinar, and I'm joining from India. I would love to know where you are joining from. Please let us know in chat here. Let me also give my introduction on the chat. Okay, I can see the introductions coming in. I can see folks have joined from Africa, Los Angeles, Iran. Philippines, Ethiopia, India, Kerala. I can see Ibrahim has joined from Nigeria. I can see someone from Bangalore as well, India. I can see uh, someone has joined from Afghanistan. I can see Shivangi has joined from Boston. I can see Peter has joined from Northern California. Awesome, awesome. Please keep, keep the introductions coming in. It's a good way to network, right? These online events before we start. So we're just setting up the project demo. So we'll just start in the next two to three minutes. Hi, Jeremy, can you check once? I've made you the panelist. Yep, I'm checking right now, just to make sure that uh, the iPad video will work. And looks like it, perfect. Let me go ahead and mount this on the stand. Make sure that won't wiggle, and then we can start. Cool. I'm all set. Awesome. Uh, do you want me to pin? Oh, sorry. Do you want me to pin me this uh, board, like which is visible right now, when you require it? Um. Yeah. So basically, when we go through the live demo, parts of it will be on the slide deck, and then parts of it will be 
um, explained here, kind of in mm -hmm. like a little whiteboard lecture session. So we can pin the video for that. Um, mm -hmm. And then to show the code, I'll actually jump over to a, a Jupyter notebook in our, our Jupyter Lab environment. So. Got it. Fine. Uh, let me just uh, quickly. Okay, I can see folks have. Uh, okay, folks are giving introductions on chat. So, folks, thank you so much for waiting. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so, we'll be starting uh, the free AI masterclass. And in this, we'll be covering how you can build your own movie recommendation engine using machine learning. And also, we'll be having a Caltech program preview, uh, which is included in this uh, webinar as well. We already have a speaker here with us, Jeremy. So uh, I just will go through like few ground rules before we start. Uh, so you need to go and put down your questions in the Q&A box uh, in case you have a query uh, and you want to ask a question to our speaker here. And the session is being recorded, so you can expect a follow-up email with recording link, webinar certificate, and a bonus offer uh, for attending this webinar. And also, uh, in case you want the webinar certificate with your full name, so make sure in the post survey, once we end the session, you will immediately get a post survey uh, link here. And uh, make sure you put your full name in the post webinar survey. So this way, we will be able to give you the webinar certificate as well with your full name. I can see a few folks have already put down questions. OK, on the Q&A box, that's great. Uh, introductions on chat, questions on the Q&A box. So before we start, uh, I would love to know uh, a little bit more about you. So you can see a quick poll on your screen. Uh, so how many years of experience do you currently have? Before we start, please uh, quickly go and go and vote for the quick poll on your screen you're seeing right now. How many years of experience do you have? You will see four quick options. The first one currently studying, second one zero to three years of experience, third one three to five years of experience, and the last one more than five years of experience. Okay, I can see folks are still joining in and folks are pretty quick. We have gotten almost half, more than half of votes for the poll. Uh, that's great. For folks who have just joined in, uh, we are starting the session now. And we, before we start, we would love to know a little bit about you before we start. So you can see a quick poll on your screen. How many years of experience do you currently have? So you can choose whichever is the most suitable option for you on the poll and submit it. I'll give five seconds more for the poll because I can see almost 80% of the folks have voted. So a few of the folks who are left, quickly go and vote for the poll on your screen you're seeing right now. Okay, I think uh, we have gotten almost all of the votes. Uh, so I'll be ending the poll in five seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let me end the poll and quickly share the results as well. Uh, so we can see that uh, folks here who are currently studying, we have them in more, more than half the quantity. And we can see for folks have uh, three to five years of experience. I can see uh, almost uh, one third of the folks have zero to three years of experience and also more than five years of experience. So that's great. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Uh, now, moving on to the agenda part. So uh, obviously, we'll be getting to know more about you, how we can help you better in terms of understanding a career in AIML and also uh, any questions related to the project in general, basically what we cover in the program also in general. So you can let us know in the Q&A box, we'll be taking those questions. Uh, the second part, uh, we'll be doing a live project demo uh, in ba basically how you can build uh, your own movie recommendation engine using uh, machine learning. And also we'll be giving a program introduction of Caltech AIML Bootcamp. The enrollment steps will be shared once we share the program preview and we'll be having a special duration for the Q&A part. We'll try to take as many questions during the live project demo as well. Uh, because I'm pretty sure if questions related to the project demo comes in, that can be answered that time if, if the speaker has time. Uh, and we, we can take the rest of the questions in the Q&A section. So, yeah. So, uh, we already have a speaker, Jeremy, here with us. Uh, Jeremy, would you like to give your introduction? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. So, I'm Jeremy Samuelson. Uh, I am... I've been a data scientist, a machine learning engineer in industry for a little over 15 years now. Uh, so presently, I have myself listed as the chief data scientist at Road Data Solutions, which is actually my own consultancy. So I actually uh, have many projects going on with many clients. Uh, my biggest client right now is actually Equifax, 
so I'm currently working with their digital identity engineering team. Uh, so that's a team that's responsible for uh, basically detecting identity fraud in its various forms. So you can have all kinds of different ways that people commit identity fraud. And uh, basically, they're looking to implement machine learning and AI to detect identity fraud anytime somebody opens a new account. So it could be a credit card, uh, you know, auto loan, mortgage, any kind of depository account, like a checking or savings account, uh, individual retirement account, anything like that, um, where, uh, you know, basically a person's trying to open some kind of financial account. We then uh, basically provide guidance for the institutions who would open and host those accounts uh, to let them know how strongly we suspect uh, that there's some kind of identity fraud at play. Um, so yeah, very exciting. Uh, identity fraud and financial fraud in general is actually a very interesting, exciting space to be in. Uh, there's a lot going on uh, kind of at any given time in that space. So yeah, very, very exciting. Um, but uh, yeah, some other in in clients that I have right now include, uh, I have a compressed gas client uh, here in the Atlanta area where I'm located. Uh, so think about like, uh, industrial gases for welding, like acetylene, uh, industrial grade oxygen. Uh, they also serve clients in the medical space. So medical grade nitrous oxide and oxygen as well for dentists, offices, veterinary clinics, uh, doctor's offices, that kind of thing. And then also restaurants. So they have sort of a beverage grade CO2 vertical, uh, and we're actually, uh, now getting into propane, which is a billion dollar space to be playing in. So very excited for them. Uh, so yeah, and I've uh, definitely uh, been able to help them kind of get into that space because there were a lot of data challenges actually uh, with just getting into that propane space in the first place. So uh, which we, we can get into later if you guys are curious about why there would be data challenges for propane. Uh, but yeah, so uh, basically, uh, yeah, I've been doing this for a long time, serving clients in a lot of different industry sectors and helping them successfully implement machine learning and AI uh, solutions uh, in many verticals of many companies. So that's me. Uh, by the way, that's a really interesting topic, uh, which you told basically you can talk about later. Uh, and also, yeah. thank you for uh, thank you for introduction. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. We'll, I think uh, before we start the live project demo, uh, we have a quick poll. Uh, basically, why exactly are you attending this webinar today? So uh, this webinar will be covering our project like demo and also Caltech AI with bootcamp as well. Uh, so you can see four quick options on your screen. This is a multiple choice questions. So you can select uh, multiple options as well because there can be multiple things you're joining this webinar today for, right? So you can see the first one, I'm looking to become an AI and ML professional. You can see the second one, I want to learn a new language or a skill. Uh, I'm here to understand if AI ML is easy to learn. And the last one, I'm interested in working on new projects from your portfolio. So I can see we're getting, I think we've gotten more than half of the votes. Okay, uh, the polls are still moving. Folks are pretty quick. They are pretty sure like why they are joining this webinar. So that's great. Uh, if you're not able to cover the reason here, you can let us know on the chat as well. So please do let us know. We would love to know. Okay, I'll be ending the poll in five seconds because I can see most of the folks have already shared their board. Okay, okay, okay. So five, four, three, two, one. Let me quickly end the poll and share the results. So we can see we have gotten the highest number of votes for I'm looking to become an AIML professional. Uh, I can see the second highest for I want to learn a new language or skill. And also uh, we've gotten uh, votes for I'm interested in working on new projects for my portfolio. So I, I think you're in the right place. You'll get a better understanding for that during this live project demo as well. And uh, much more projects will be, which we cover in the program. And the third one, I'm here to understand if AIML is easy to learn. So uh, I think that makes sense. Uh, let's start the live project demo. So over to you, Zen. All right, cool. Um, so let's see. Uh, are, are you going to drive the slide deck while I talk? Sure. sure. Bit? Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, yep. So, okay. So today we're going to learn uh, how to make a recommendation system or, you know, recommendation engine is sometimes what they're called, um, specifically for recommending movies. But <clears throat> really, uh, I mean, as we're going to show here uh, in the next couple of slides, you actually can use these in all kinds of contexts. 
Uh, next slide, please, Russia. Uh, so what are recommender systems? So basically this uh, is a pretty broad term actually, uh, but this describes a specific family of machine learning algorithms. Um, and they each kind of can do different things, um, but uh, we'll, we'll kind of talk about some of the use cases, but you could actually argue that recommender systems are uh, quite possibly the most broadly used type of machine learning in industry. So many companies, across many different industry sectors uh, are using recommender systems, you know, all the time. And actually the same company may even be using them in many different contexts as well. So we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, next slide. All right, so one possible use case uh, for recommender systems are uh, for search and for ads. Um, so for example, you know, if you're searching on Google, um, right, how is Google so fast, right? Like how is Google able to so quickly come up with, you know, a bunch of results? Um, there are actually a lot of moving parts to that, same with Reddit and Wikipedia. Uh, but, uh, you know, these are gonna use what we actually might call something like page rank algorithms, where uh, the recommendation is not necessarily tailored to an individual user, uh, so each different user, if, if you you or I or any of us searched for the same thing on Google or Wikipedia, we would all see the same results. So the result isn't necessarily tailored to us, but these search engines are essentially making recommendations to us based on what it has deemed to be most relevant uh, based on our search. So we have these kinds of algorithms, these, these page rank ones. Um, we're not going to actually discuss these ones specifically today because this is sort of not so much in the context of, uh, you know, movie recommender systems. Uh, although, again, in some contexts, even something like, say, Netflix or Hulu or any of these streaming services will still use something like this to some degree. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you go to search their catalog, say there's some show you've heard about and you're like, oh, I wonder if this is on Netflix. Uh, you go to search, their search engine that searches all their content uh, basically has to make a guess at what thing you're probably looking for, especially if you don't really know the the title of the movie or the show you're looking for, which uh, I, I'm i guilty of. I, <laughs> I quite often don't really exactly remember the, the name of the show I want. Uh, so they have this sort of recommender system that then figures out what's probably the most relevant thing that I meant to, to find and then kind of, you know, makes recommendations to me based on that. Uh, so that's one thing, little extension of that actually that uh, to show you how much these are in use. <clears throat> Again, Netflix or Hulu do this all the time. At least I've seen this where you search for a show, say there's something you want to watch. Uh, and then it turns out they actually at that time don't have that show on the platform. Maybe they used to have it on the platform, uh, but it got taken off or maybe it just never was. Uh, but what's interesting is they don't just say, oh, sorry, we don't have this. If you've noticed this, if you search for a show that's not on the Netflix platform, Form, they'll actually say, oh, we don't have this right now, but if this is what you're looking for, here are some other things that you're probably interested in, right? So they actually do kind of like just string right together these two recommendations, right? Of like, hey, this is probably what you mean, and we don't have it, but this is probably something else you'd be interested in, right? So uh, yeah, so a lot of these, again, get used in a lot of different contexts. Uh, next slide, please. All right, and then this one uh, comes up a lot. I know we've all seen this. So uh, you know, you log, you know, you hit the Amazon.com landing page, and immediately before you even search anything, Amazon's already making recommendations about stuff you'll probably want to buy based on things you've looked at before, things you've bought before, all that kind of stuff. Um, and this shows up <clears throat> again on you know online merchant store or websites like Amazon, Etsy, eBay. Uh, and a million others that you can probably think of. <clears throat> I put Zillow on there actually, because that's kind of top of mind for me. Uh, so my wife and I are looking at houses right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're looking to kind of move a little bit further out from the Atlanta area. Uh, we're already a little bit outside the perimeter, but we're looking to kind of move a little bit further out, more into the suburbs, into maybe like the Woodstock or Kennesaw area. And I can promise you Zillow definitely knows this about us, right? So, <laughs> so uh, now I think uh, just about every day I'm getting emails, uh, and other notifications from Zillow that are like, Hey, check out this new listing in Woodstock that we think you'd like. Right. Um, and they're looking at things like, you know, houses in our 
price range that we've looked at, number of bedrooms and bathrooms, like all of that kind of stuff, Zillow's making these determinations of like, hey, you'd probably be interested in this, right? Uh, so yeah, I'm sure any of those real estate websites, Redfin, any of those are going to do the same thing as well, just like Zillow is. So basically in all kinds of contexts, anytime that you have like stuff listed on a website, there's a recommendation or sorry, a recommendation, recommendation system in use, uh, to basically show you stuff that you're, you know, likely going to like, right? Because they make more money, the more stuff you buy. And their catalog is so vast, there's no way that you're going to get through it all yourself. So, you know, basically the these websites sort of help you out and help themselves out at the same time by showing you stuff that you're very likely to buy. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. And this is sort of our most relevant sort of category of stuff for today. Um, so sort of like con content recommendation. So we've got Netflix on there, of course, but things like Spotify, Pinterest, YouTube, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, right? All, all these different types of social media, uh, anywhere where there's content. And really the way that these businesses work, uh, well, Netflix is maybe a little bit different, right? So you have, you're on a subscription basis with Netflix. The more you find shows that you want to watch, the more worth it it is to keep your subscription and keep paying, you know, whatever it is they're charging these days per month. I don't even look at it. Um, <clears throat> so I couldn't tell you what it, <laughs> what it is. Uh, things like Spotify, depending on what kind of plan you're on, they actually play ads for you every so often. So the more songs you listen to, the longer you're on the app, the more ads they can play for you, the more the more money they make, right? So uh, if they play something you don't like, you're going to end up skipping it or you know, you're going to turn the app off or whatever. So they definitely want to keep playing stuff for you that they think you're going to want to listen to. Same with you know YouTube. Uh, I think it's been said about a lot of these platforms, Facebook, all that kind of stuff. The thing that they really produce, right? The thing that they really sort of like manufacture and export is your attention, uh, right? Because that's how they make money is having you, you know, look at ads or, you know, and especially if you click through on these ads. So there are actually kind of, kind of two things that play there. One, they want to keep showing you content that they figure you're going to want to stick around and consume, right? Because the longer you're on the platform, the more ads you're going to see, uh, the more money they're going to make from those impressions, as they're called of showing you those ads. Uh, but then also they make even more money if you actually click through on the ad that you're shown. So there's also a recommendation system trying to figure out what would be the most relevant ad to show you that you might like, the, what's the ad that you're most likely to click through on. Um, so yeah, in short, there are a lot of things you could recommend. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's, it's really, it'd be hard to, you know, not come up with, uh, or, you know, to tell you things that you couldn't recommend, right? So, you know, this is stuff that's used in the financial system to recommend products uh, to, you know, customers at retail banks. Um, to an extent, actually, the, some of this logic that goes into recommender systems is also used in algorithmic trading, right? So you have to know, like, stock picking, so what what equities are we actually going to like make a move on today based on what's happening in the news? What are we seeing in the price action? Uh, so, you know, those those stocks that it's like we should trade these stocks. That's also like basically a list of recommendations. Right. Uh, so really, yeah, no shortage of things that you could recommend. And, uh, you know, hopefully this illustrates just how much uh, these really are in use in various sectors uh, in industry. Um, next slide, please. Yes, sure. Uh, we just want to see like how much attention you know the audience has been doing while you're speaking about the life project. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So oh, we I have... forgot to mention as well. Uh, yeah. Sorry, the the type of the type of recommender system we talked about uh, or that recommends content is called the the one that we'll talk about today is called collaborative filtering. I forgot to mention that. So remember in the search we talked about. Uh, oh, go back, back up. I think we've there we go. Uh, back to the poll. Sorry. <laughs> um, so for the, the search, we actually uh, talked about that those are page rank algorithms. Uh, and for uh, the content recommendation, those are collaborative filtering. So here's our, our poll question is, what, which type of recommender systems uh, do most companies use? This is a, a quick, quick check to make sure you're all with me. You can see a quick poll on your screen. Uh, which type of recommended system do you do most companies use? 
So uh, you can see four options here, page rank algorithms, second one, collaborative filtering, third one, both, fourth one, neither. Okay, I can see, uh, you know, like two, two options getting almost close words. So let's see, like, if you're able to guess this one. Let's see how much attention you have been paying so far before we start, start the live project demo. Okay, I think uh, we'll end the poll in five seconds because I can see it. Most of the folks have answered the uh, poll. So five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let me share the results as well. So which one is the correct answer, Jeremy? Uh, so I was going to say both, uh, which most of you got or the biggest chunk of you got. So that's great. Yep. So again, uh, a lot of companies. So again, think of even YouTube, right? Uh, if you're searching for something in particular, there's a recommender system that has to recommend the most relevant content based on what you searched uh, and then based on stuff that you've watched historically and stuff that you've, you're watching today. Uh, they have to then make content recommendations with collaborative filtering uh, based on, you know, based on basically what they think you're going to keep watching so that you'll stay uh, so that you'll stay on the, uh, you know, on the platform. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and go to the sort of like live demo. So um, if you can pin the uh, iPad so that we can see that sure. and I'll kind of. Sure, I'll just stop the... sharing my screen and then I'll just pin this. Yeah, it should work now. Uh, I, I hope uh, the video is visible to you folks. You will see a white blank screen, uh, which is pinned right now. Uh... I think, okay, here, actually, let me do this. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, that'll work for the coding portion as well. Stop sharing. You can go ahead and share. Oh. Maybe it's not going to let me. Sorry, just one sec. Uh, from where are you trying to share? Which, which account? Here we okay, go. Yeah, it's working. Yeah. So, Sometimes for some reason it just uh, like grays out the option. I don't know what it. Okay, so what you guys should see is uh, just a white screen. Uh, you can see my hand waving. Uh, let me know if that's visible to you guys. I guess I should watch the chat. It should be visible. I think so. Please let us know in chat. Yeah, all good. Yep. Okay. Good. 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 Okay. So what I'm going to do is sort of explain this in a way that's very intuitive. Um, you know, so that we can just sort of understand like the nature of what we're doing and get an intuitive sense of like how we go about making predictions. Uh, then in anything like this, you have to sort of give sort of a uh, mathematical formality to what you're doing so that you know kind of how to calculate your predictions. Uh, so all of that kind of stuff will develop sort of here in this, uh, on, on this paper on my desk. Uh, and then I will jump over to a Jupyter lab that we have in our uh, Jupyter, Jupyter lab environment and show you guys the code. Um, okay, so uh, I did mention this type of algorithm. And again, there are so many different ways that you can go about uh, doing uh, recommender systems. This is just one way. I will mention some others that are kind of a bit deeper uh, that you could certainly cover in uh, in the boot camp uh, in, in sort of the, the broader program. Uh, again, this is just sort of a, a tip of the iceberg introduction today. So this is collaborative. I had to think really hard about how to spell it, sorry. <laughs> so collaborative filtering. And there are actually different types of collaborative filtering you can do. Uh, this one that we're going to cover specifically is called user user collaborative filtering. So we're actually going to be kind of looking at different users and, and essentially making rec tailored recommendations to users based on what other users uh, seem to like. So <clears throat> let's just do like a really kind of quick silly example of what this would look like. So let's say uh, we've got three different people on some stream service that, uh, you know, where you can watch movies. So let's say we've got Sukesh. And Sukesh has watched a bunch of movies and given ratings. 
So let's say that Sukesh has watched the Batman. Uh, he really, really liked the Batman because Sukesh has excellent taste. Um, he watched John Wick. Also very much liked John Wick, right? Gave that 4.5 out of five stars. Uh, let's say then that he watched, let's see, I'm gonna have to scooch this over so you guys can continue to see. Oh, sorry, you guys are getting some memories popping up on my computer. Uh, so then Sukesh watched Sisu. Uh, they gave that a five out of five. Then uh, they also watched, for some reason, 27 Dresses, not really a huge fan of 27 Dresses, uh, and they also watched uh, The Notebook. And also uh, did not particularly enjoy The Notebook. Okay, so these are the ratings that Sukesh has given for these five movies in this example. Okay, now uh, let's say we also have Jeremy. Jeremy also liked The Batman. So Jeremy gave the Batman 4.5 stars. Jeremy also liked John Wick. So he gave that one 4.5 out of 5 stars. Uh, Jeremy hasn't seen Sisu yet. <clears throat> and then also, by chance, he's also seen 27 Dresses and The Notebook and didn't particularly enjoy either of those, though. So, uh, gave those pretty low ratings as well. Now let's say we have another user, Sarah. And Sarah has essentially the opposite taste of these other two. So she actually did not like the Batman. Uh, uh, liked John Wick a little bit better. I mean, Keanu Reeves is just so likable. Um, didn't like Sisu, uh, but she loved 27 Dresses and The Notebook. So now the question is, do you recommend Sisu to Jeremy? Yes or no, and why or why not? So <clears throat> the logic here is that if we look at, say, Jeremy and Sukesh at their ratings, at least for the movies where we actually have ratings between the two of them, they actually really seem to closely agree, right? Uh, so at least intuitively, Jeremy and Sukesh seem to actually have pretty similar taste. And also, uh, again, for the movies that both Jeremy and Sarah have rated, they actually seem to have kind of opposite taste, right? Anything that Sarah really does, doesn't like, Jeremy does like. Anything that Jeremy... Uh, Jeremy, you know, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Um, I okay? Think, yeah, yeah, I think uh, someone is not able to see the canvas. Uh, folks, please oh, wow. let us know on chat here. Is it visible to you? Like a whiteboard which is writing on? It should be pinned uh, to the screen. Yeah, it's visible. Yeah, someone is writing, it's not visible. So yeah, uh, maybe you might have, you know, like, uh, like might be being, viewing a different video or something like that on the webinar. So uh, just check out the Canvas uh, screen and just click on it in case it's not visible. Please continue. Yeah. So sorry. So yeah, actually, if you guys aren't able to see it um, from me pinning it, I think you also have the option of pinning it yourself, um, in which case you can just watch it uh, as well directly. Um, so, basically, here, we might determine that it would be a great idea to recommend Sisu to Jeremy, because we think he would like it, right? So, uh, kind of the more formal, kind of mathy way to say this is uh, Jeremy's ratings actually seem to be very positively correlated with Sukesh. So, if Sukesh liked Sisu, which he did, uh, then we actually suspect pretty strongly that Jeremy would also like Sisu because so far everything else that the two, these two users have in common, everything that Sukesh likes, Jeremy also likes. So there's this thing that Sukesh liked that Jeremy hasn't seen yet. So uh, we should recommend this thing uh, to, to Jeremy. Um, for some algorithms, not particularly the one that we're going to cover today, there's also quite a bit of information in the relationship between Jeremy and Sarah as well. So these don't have um, a strong positive correlation, 
Uh, but they still are strongly correlated. The correlation just happens to be negative, right? So again, if Jeremy really likes it, we can count on that Sarah really didn't like it. And if Jeremy really didn't like it, we can count on that Sarah really did. So uh, where Sarah really didn't like Sisu, that is also actually pretty indicative of um, that Jeremy would probably like it. So, and I see a, sub, a couple of other questions. So a couple of you are asking, how do you pin video in the chat so uh where uh the ipad which again is just is going to show up as other jeremy samuelson uh where that is uh, a panelist so you're going to be able to see that up top if you actually just double click on it uh that will automatically pin it uh to your video so that that's the only video that you see or if you right click on it uh there will be an option to pin it uh and then you uh yeah and then, then you can see it. Um, maybe I'll just show you guys real quick. So I'm going to hit remove pin to get it unpinned. So you can see it up here. So there is an option if you click on this uh, to pin it. But if I just double click it, then Zoom actually just pins it to, to my main video. Um, and then since I'm sharing my screen, then I'm able to see it. Hopefully, you're also able to see it. That's why we're doing it this way. OK. Very cool. All right. So um, so that's the intuition, anyway, of how we make recommendations in this user-user collaborative filtering. Um, but let's also um, introduce some notation so we can now give this a bit more, uh, again, kind of a formal mathematical treatment. So this is arranged in kind of this table. Uh, or in the context of machine learning, this is often thought of more as a matrix. So the rows tell us, or, you know, each row is a user, right? A set of ratings for a particular user. So this will be n rows, where n is our number of users. Okay. Then the columns, so like this column here, this is all the ratings on the Batman, right? For people who have uh, rated the Batman, but actually also for people who haven't. So if a user has not seen or has not rated the Batman, their entry will just be blank, um, which is actually fine. That's exactly what we want, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, if you think about it, if your whole matrix was actually filled out, there would be no recommendations to make because every user has already seen every movie and given you a rating on whether or not they liked it. So uh, kind of nothing for us. <laughs> for us uh, machine learning engineers to do at this point if that's the situation we have. So we actually count on uh, that this matrix is going to be very sparse uh, and that a lot of values will be missing, which if you think about it makes a lot of sense because um, I don't even know how much stuff they have on Netflix right now. I imagine on the order of like thousands of shows and, and movies. Um, I definitely have not seen anywhere near all of the content, right? I've seen a very, 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 very small fraction of what's actually there. And, uh, you know, that's kind of probably what most people are like, right? So probably most users on the Netflix platform or any platform uh, have probably only ever consumed or, and rated a very small fraction of what's actually there to be seen. So, um, so at any rate, this in this quick example, I filled out most of them. But in reality, much of this table would actually be empty. Um, so we have n rows, which gives us our number of users. And we have m columns, which is our number of, uh, I'm going to actually say items here. Because again, um, we don't have to necessarily just recommend movies. In this example, we're kind of going to use a data set that is about movies. But these could really be about anything. All right. And this, I think, is. Pretty straightforward notation so far. I don't think anyone's going to freak out about this. This next thing, uh, hopefully nobody freaks out about. So in math, we like to use a lot of these uh, Greek characters. So we use capital omega, which is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. And if we say omega sub j, this would be the set of all users Oops, who have rated 
movie J, right? So basically any given movie, right? The Jth movie uh, will be rated by some people, won't be rated by most people. So Omega sub J basically is the set of all the people who have given a rating to that particular movie. Okay. So um, that's what that notation means. Um, so hopefully there are no questions about that. If there are, go ahead and drop those in the chat. So let's think about kind of our approach. So sort of the naive approach here uh, that could be used, and that actually in the case of like page rank and stuff like that, this actually is very much what happens. Um, but uh, what we're essentially predicting here to make a recommendation is a score. So we're going to label that S, and I'm going to say S is a function of I and J. So in other words, this is the score that you would predict for user I and item J. So what score do you think user I would give to item J that you're recommending, right? And this is ultimately how you make recommendations, right? So it's not really this deterministic answer where your model's like, recommend this stuff, don't recommend this stuff. Basically, what your model really predicts is the score that this user would give to this particular item. And then you make recommendations based on kind of the, the ordering of those scores, right? So the thing that scores the highest, that's the thing you're going to show to them first. But then, you know, you can kind of show them other things as well, sort of in descending order of how high you think they would score them. So basically, uh, we could go like this. So if I surround the set in these sort of vertical brackets, this is like the size of the set, right? So the number of things in the set, uh, the nerdy math word for that is the cardinality of the set. So we basically sum over all the users. So I'm going to say all the I prime in omega sub j. So I'm using I prime just because I'm summing over users, but user I is the user in particular that I'm interested in. Um, so we're summing over all the users that have given a rating to this thing in question. Uh, and we're basically summing up their rating. Right, the rating from you know each user, so user I prime for item J, we add up all those ratings and then we divide by the number of people who have given such a rating. So essentially that would just be sort of the uh, average of the rating, right? So the average rating, uh, which this is an entirely naive approach. This is not tailored to our users, right? So under a, a scheme like this, every user would actually basically see the exact same recommendations, right? We are not in any way considering a user's taste. Uh, this is literally just kind of like, hey, everybody overall seems to like this movie. So, you know, here's here's this recommendation for this movie. So the way that we actually can fix this, because we don't really want to do this, what we want is we actually want to consider more strongly users that are more similar to the user in question, right? Just like back in the, the table that we uh, sort of constructed for our intuitive example, uh, right? So like, for example, in making recommendations to Jeremy, we actually want to consider Sukesh more strongly than we consider other users because Sukesh is very, 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 very correlated with Jeremy. So um, we're going to introduce this idea of actually doing sort of a weighted mean. So instead of just doing a straight up average, of our recommendations, we might actually uh, do this weighted average, where again, we're summing over all users who have given a rating to item J. And then their rating is weighted by their weight between user I and the user in question, right? Between user I and user I prime. So the rating of user I prime gets weighted by this weight for how much do we want to consider that, that particular user 
or that particular user's tastes when we're making a recommendation to user I. Uh, and then to make it so that this average kind of comes out correctly or you know kind of gets scaled the way that we want, uh, we then sum up for uh, the magnitudes of all these weights, because again, the weights actually could be negative. Um, so that's actually what we're ultimately kind of going to do. Uh, although at this point, I have not told you guys how exactly would we calculate these weights. So we are going to get to that. We are going to talk about exactly how these weights are calculated. Uh, but first, there's actually another consideration that we have to make, and that is that we have to consider, oops, we'll move that back down. User bias. So basically, different users are going to have different behaviors in terms of how they rate things. And this is also something we have to consider, right? So, um, you know, one user, maybe they actually really dislike most things. And so most movies, they just rate a one. And if they really, really like something, maybe they'll give it like a 3.5 or maybe a four if they absolutely loved it, but they don't give anything a five, right? So maybe that's that user's behavior. On the other hand, another user might actually, you know, give most things like a four or a 4.5. And if they really, really love it, they you know they give it a five, and then they basically have never given anything a one ever. If they really don't like a movie, they might give it a two or a two point five, right? So you have these two different users uh, that are kind of severely biased in one direction or another, um, and that, that there's you know there's kind of a whole spectrum of like how biased different users might actually be. So we have to be able to account for that. And so to account for that, what we do is we say, you know what, I actually don't care so much about the absolute rating values themselves. Uh, what I care about more is how much do how much does this rating from a particular user deviate from the average rating that we see from this user, right? So we're going to say actually that we have this deviation, which I'm going to denote with lowercase delta. So the deviation for user i for item j is actually going to be the rating that user i gives to item j minus I'm going to say R bar, which is the average rating that user I has given for things that we know user I has rated, right? So uh, for basically all of the sort of known ratings that user I has given, what's the average? And then basically what's the rating that they give to this thing minus that average, right? So now instead of thinking about this just in absolute terms, what is their rating? we're thinking more about how does each rating kind of deviate from that person's mean, right? Now we can actually restructure our prediction for how do we think this person is going to, like how do we think this particular user would score this item? And we can actually make that prediction more in terms of, or exactly in terms of, uh, what do we think would be their deviation from their mean? Right. So based on how other users have deviated from their mean and their rating of this thing, how much would this user deviate in their mean rating in rating this thing? So essentially, we're going to estimate this deviation. So in sort of statistical estimator theory, um, one thing that we do, sort of a little nuance of our notation you'll get used to, I guess, is if there's this real thing, that is a real value to be known, and we want to estimate that thing, our statistical estimation of that thing, we put this little caret on top, we call this hat. So if delta is the real thing we're interested in, delta hat is our estimator of that thing. So basically we're going to estimate delta. So we want this estimation of the deviation, which we can again just sort of uh, estimate as an average of this particular user's deviation from their mean, 
right? So this would be, oops, my marker is drying out just a bit. So, or sorry, actually, I think I believe I said that wrong to make sure I'm not confusing anybody. Uh, so if we want to predict a user's deviation uh, from their mean score, from their mean rating on uh, item J, uh, what we're actually going to do is, again, we're going to consider users that are uh, closer to them, right, that are similar to them. And we're actually going to look at, for those users, what is their sort of average deviation from their mean on this thing. So summing over all users who have given a rating to item J, we look at their deviation, which is, again, their score that they've given to item J minus the mean of all the scores that they've given, right? And bear in mind, we're summing over this I prime. So uh, this is all contained within that sum. All right, so then our user's score that we're estimating you could say is actually their average score for this user, which actually sort of represents the bias for this particular user, right? So sort of on average, how do they rate things? Plus their estimated deviation for item J. So this is actually going to be our, um, our estimations or essentially our estimated score for how much do we think user I is going to like uh, item J, right? How do we think they would score this stuff? So then kind of inserting everything in uh, to fully flesh this formula out that we're going to be implementing in code. We have that our estimated score for user I of item J is going to be the average score from user I plus, now this formula for the average deviation. And again, we want to make sure that this is the weighted average deviation for uh, users that um, are similar, again, uh, in, in terms of their taste to this user in question. So this would be the sum over all the all right, it's getting a little bit small. Uh, I sub prime in omega j. So basically, again, over all the users uh, who have given a rating for omega j, we have the weight between the user in question and the user that we're comparing them to. And then we're looking at that user's deviation. So their rating for this thing. minus that user's average rating. And then again, to make sure that this actually all comes out to an appropriate average, uh, we're then going to sum up all of our weights as well. And again, accounting for that they could be positive or negative, we take the absolute value. So finally, this is actually our um, prediction. Uh, this is our, our formula for making a prediction, right? Our estimated score for user I on item J. Um, in practice, though, we actually sometimes do this without that user's average score, um, which a little bit makes sense if you think about it, because for this particular user, right, for user I, their average is actually always the same. Right, so this is essentially a constant for a given user, right? For user I, so then essentially the thing that they would score highly would be a thing that has the highest positive deviation from their their average. So essentially, all the information really is in this term here, uh, where we get this average deviation. Um, but again, 
yeah, some some sometimes you can use it. Uh, I mean, you can use it if you want to to have the whole formula, or you can just look at the deviations. Both are technically going to get you the same answer, so they're both the correct way to go about it. All right. So now, um, now is sort of the question of we've been talking about these weights for these weighted averages. So how to calculate the weights? All right, and this is actually relatively straightforward, especially if you have, um, you know, have any kind of background in statistics uh, or probability. This is going to be probably pretty intuitive for you. Uh, I do see someone mentioning something about the Hamiltonian of the matrix. Um, so I guess I'll, let, let me acknowledge that really quickly. Um, there are lots and lots of methods for doing this. Uh, there are lots of methods for even calculating or, you know, giving a collaborative filter. Um, many of these actually involve different um, methodologies of decomposing the matrix, right? So you can do like a singular, singular value decomposition, uh, many other types of decompositions. Uh, and then depending on what type of decomposition you do, there are different kind of techniques uh, for, again, how you actually ultimately arrive at the, sorry, the score that we just calculated that's uh, that I've just put away. <laughs> but uh, so uh, where most of you, uh, kind of from our poll earlier, uh, fully 75% of you, I believe, uh, are either still studying, like you're still in school, or have little to no experience. Um, I'm not really going to dive too much into those types of techniques. Um, so, but I will actually kind of warn you guys: if you do want to pursue knowing this and like really knowing it, um, you will want to brush up on your linear algebra uh, so that you are more familiar with those matrix decompositions. Uh, because, yes, actually, to do many of these uh, techniques more efficiently and frankly, as efficiently as you would kind of need to be uh, to implement this stuff in industry, uh, then uh, yeah, then you're, you're gonna need to be familiar with all that stuff. Um, and actually to be completely fair, uh, if we wanted to actually think about like companies like Netflix, Hulu, you know, any of those, how are they doing this today? Um, I would bet that very few of them are actually still using collaborative filtering today. Um, again, this is very much like an introductory algorithm. So uh, I'm showing this to you guys sort of as an introduction to uh, how do recommender systems work? How does collaborative filtering work? Um, if you were to ask me to guess how is Netflix doing this today, uh, I would almost certainly wager that they're using some type of deep neural network architecture. And in particular, it would have to be something like autoencoders or a type of unsupervised network called a restricted Boltzmann machine. Um, so, uh, yeah, there are a lot of more sophisticated techniques out there than what I'm showing you today. Uh, but again, where some of you are, where, you know, three out of four of you uh, are probably brand new to this, uh, I don't want to throw you into the deep end of the pool. I want to show you, <laughs> I want to show you guys a good starter, starter way to do this. And then uh, if that, you know, gets you hungry for more, uh, check out the boot camp. Uh, we, we get a lot into uh, different deep learning topics. And in fact, just as a bit of a side, an aside, um, yeah, we do cover deep learning. We do cover advanced deep learning with computer vision, natural language processing, and, uh, even things like recommender systems as well. So that's absolutely something you can dive deeper into if that interests you in the bootcamp. Um, okay. Uh, so back to, uh, sort of the thing at hand, uh, with our statistical collaborative filtering. Um, so essentially, if you've taken a stats or probability class, you may remember uh, there's this kind of famous guy in statistics and probability. His name's Pearson. So he actually has this uh, statistic called correlation. So if you have two variables, X and Y, uh, then you can actually calculate their correlation uh, thusly. So here in the uh, denominator, we end up taking the sum, uh, and we'll say as i goes from 1 to n, so we have n observations in our sample. 
of x sub i minus x bar squared, and we take the square root of that, multiplied by the sum as i goes from 1 to n of y minus y bar squared. And then in the numerator, we actually just get the uh, sort of cross, uh, it's not exactly the cross correlation, but uh, sort of a the sort of like cross term here of these. So we get x minus x bar times y minus y bar. So this is how we would just calculate the correlation of two random variables uh, that we've observed. So what we're essentially going to do here is we're going to let the weight between two users be this correlation essentially adapted to uh, observations that we have about these two users. So we have that our weight between user i and user i prime is going to be, uh, let's see, and I have to pick a new variable here. Uh, so let's go that this is the square root of the sum of, we'll say, j in, it's another, uh, we'll just say set A, which A is the set of all movies that these two users have in common. So for all the movies that uh, user i and user i prime have in common, we're going to add this up. So we have all the ratings from uh, user i on all the movies that he has in common, he or she has in common with user i prime minus the average rating from user i squared. We take the square root of that whole thing. And then similarly, we take the square root of the sum again over all the movies that these two have in common. And we look at the ratings from user i prime for all of these different things, different movies, items, whatever, minus the average rating given by user i prime squared. We take the square root of all that. And then up here on top, we again get this kind of cross product thing. So again, summing up over all the movies that these two have in common, and we get the deviation for user i, which is user i j minus r bar for user i multiplied by r sub i prime j, because this is for the other user, minus the average rating from user i prime. So we really do just take this Pearson's correlation and just essentially calculate the correlation between these two users, uh, given the things that they that they have in common, right? Given the, the movies that they have both given a rating to. All right. Um, then let's see. I think actually, how are we doing on time, Russia? I don't, I'm not sure how much time I actually have for this. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Something I could skip if we're running low. Yeah, maybe maybe we can cut it short a little bit, uh, but okay, sure. uh, we can extend like for a few minutes, you know, as you're comfortable. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, something I was just going to mention, it's actually very, very similar to Pearson's correlation that is also commonly used. It's called the cosine similarity, uh, which is essentially how you use the angle between two vectors to determine how similar they are. So... Um, but yeah, that's just kind of a thing that we'll mention quickly uh, as sort of an alternative that you could use in your implementations. 
So now there's kind of a problem of what if the two users don't actually have any movies in common? Uh, what do we do then? It's actually quite simple. Uh, we actually just don't consider the two users in each other's predictions. Um, and in fact, um, typically we actually in practice will set sort of a threshold of how many items or how many movings these, these uh, users have to have in common uh, for us to even consider them. Which again, from a statistical perspective, just makes sense. Uh, if you don't have enough data, then your statistical estimations are you know, not going to be very sound. Uh, and also for sort of uh, consideration of runtime complexity or you know, uh, sort of complexity of your algorithm so that it runs somewhat reasonably, uh, we actually often don't calculate scores or don't uh, kind of consider the scores or the weights for um, every user, you know, for every other user when we want to make a prediction for every user. Uh, we actually, again, just look at the similarity between users and we'll do sort of a essentially K nearest neighbors, uh, which is another machine learning algorithm. Um, but the idea is that basically we'll say K is like 25 or maybe upwards of 50, depending on how large the data set is. Uh, and then we'll essentially say when we're actually making predictions for this user, um, we're only going to consider the 25 most similar other users, uh, you know, when we when we compare them. So uh, that's kind of how we do that in practice. Uh, so now, quickly, I will jump over to our Jupyter Notebook environment. Uh, so we'll unpin this, and I'll just show you guys this in code really quickly. Um, oh, I should zoom in. I always find when I'm teaching that they need it a little more zoomed in to be able to see. Okay. So um, oh, that actually still is running. Shoot. Oh, I see. Okay. It looks like we had a little bit of a server issue. So I've lost my compute kernel, uh, which is unfortunate. So, okay. <laughs> okay. So I will show you the code. Unfortunately, it looks like the end of it didn't run. I reran uh, re a bunch of it so that it would kind of be presented more in order and look nice. And it looks like I lost my compute kernel partway through. So I do apologize for that. OK, so, uh, so here we actually are doing some imports. Uh, so we're importing Pickle, which is essentially sort of this universal uh, way of saving files and loading files back up. So yeah, if you're unfamiliar, literally any kind of Python object that you can come up with, you can save that. Uh, with pickle and then reload it again later. So very, very handy. Uh, then we have NumPy and Pandas, which are absolutely core staples in the data scientists uh, toolbox. And then for this particular use case, there are just some things that I'm going to use. So uh, counter from the collections library, shuffle, which is a utility from scikit-learn, and then sorted list, uh, which is a nice object from the excuse me, from the sorted containers uh, library. All right, so uh, quickly, we did have to do some data processing uh, on this data set. So here's the link here, if you guys wanted to get a hold of this data set and use it yourself. So you can find this on Kaggle, uh, kaggle.com slash data sets slash group lens slash movie lens. This is the movie lens dash 20M dash data set. So this is quite a large data set. This is 20 million movie ratings. Uh, so it's a very large file. Uh, in order to actually get this to run on the compute cluster that we have available in our Jupyter lab, because they're not you know massive compute instances, um, I'm going to have to actually sort of pare this data set down just a bit. So you guys will kind of see how I do that. Um, in practice, again, if you were to do this at, say, Netflix or anywhere else, you would actually be using something like Spark. Uh, to do sort of this like uh, parallelized, you know, cluster computing. Um, but again, want to keep this entry level for everybody, just to kind of give you an idea of how this gets done. Um, so we're instead just going to um, pare down our data set to a, a more manageable size. So we read this in. Kind of a good thing to do is to sort of run this head method on your data frame, just to look at the first five rows and just get a sense for what you uh, what you have here. Uh, we can see that in terms of the number of variables we have or the number of columns, 
not too many at all. Uh, this really is just, you know, a lot of observations that are very, very simple. So we have the user ID. Uh, so user one has been very busy. They've, you know, clearly given ratings to a good number of movies. We have a movie ID. We have a rating, uh, which can have a minimum of 0.5 stars or a maximum of five stars. And then we have the timestamp, uh, which we're going to go ahead and just drop because our algorithm doesn't use it. All right, so uh, I've kind of checked this and found that our user IDs are sequential and they go from zero to about 100,000. There are about 100,000 users. And, and um, so we don't want this to start at one. In programming, we typically like things to be indexed starting at zero. So I'm actually just going to subtract one from every user ID so that our user IDs are now zero to, again, actually about 100,000. Um, Looking at the movies, found that there are actually only about 20,000 unique movie IDs in the data. Um, but again, probably due to movies being sort of taken off, you know, or, you know, put on the platform, then removed. Um, they want every movie ID to have kind of a unique, uh, you know, a, a unique ID for each movie. Um, but as it is in the data set, um, we actually have our movie IDs also going up to about 100,000. Uh, even though there are only about 20,000 in there. So they're kind of off by, you know, a whole order of magnitude. Uh, so just sort of for ease of handling, uh, we're going to create a new mapping that assigns new movie IDs uh, that go from zero to about 20,000. So that's what this code does here. Um, so yeah, we get all of the unique movie IDs. Uh, we create this movie to index dictionary. We start our index at zero, and then basically we go through all of our uh, unique movie IDs, and then make this, we kind of populate this dictionary with the movie ID and its index. And again, we're incrementing the index every time we do that. And ultimately, uh, once we have this dictionary that gives us a movie and an index, a new index, uh, then we go ahead and uh, create a movie index variable in our data frame uh, by using this apply method on the data frame. Uh, and then to drop the timestamp, very simple. There's just the drop method. So we just give it a list of columns that we want to drop. In this case, the only one we actually want to drop is timestamp. Uh, everything else we'll hang on to. Uh, now is the part where we actually want to go ahead and shrink things down. So ultimately, what I've done here is I've picked the 10,000 most active users. So uh, these are sort of like the top 10,000 users in terms of like these are the people that have rated the most movies uh, and the uh, 2,000 most rated movies, right? So we have the most active users that are giving the most ratings and the most actively rated movies uh, so that we can, again, have an interesting data set to work with, but also one that's considerably smaller uh, than the original one that we had. Because again, for, for our little compute instance here, it <laughs> turned out to be too much to, uh, to try to crunch the whole thing. Um, so basically, we have to count up how many times each user ID and movie index occurs. Uh, then we extract the users and movie IDs uh, from the most common 10,000 and the most common 2,000, respectively. And then we filter our original data frame to create this small data frame. Uh, now what we have is, again, uh, this entirely different sort of uh, indexing of user IDs and movies. So we're just going to quickly re-index that so that we, uh, again, have everything in order for easier handling. Uh, and finally, if you're dealing with limited compute resources, this is an important step. <clears throat> uh, so once I've done all that processing, which actually took uh, quite a bit of runtime to do, uh, I went ahead and saved this smaller data frame to a CSV so that now if anything kind of breaks or goes down, if I lose my compute kernel going forward, uh, I don't have to redo all of that stuff, right? I can just load in uh, this smaller uh, rating data set here. So that's what this does. So this loads this in. Uh, again, checks the first five rows so that we have any idea what we're looking at. And also to kind of confirm that your import worked as intended. 
Uh, now, this is something that you don't typically do in machine learning. Uh, so a lot of these, um, you know, methods that use things like singular value decomposition and all that kind of stuff, frankly, you don't really want those data sets in a data frame. Uh, Pandas data frames are nice for some types of analysis, actually a lot of analyses, um, but they're not the fastest objects, really. Um, so, yeah, basically, uh, so even though we have a smaller data frame, uh, this still is not going to be the most efficient, computationally speaking, the most efficient way to kind of keep our data. So just because of how uh, these objects are structured in Python, uh, if we wanted to say, you know, loop through, do something that where we have to loop through all n users and all m movies, which we would have to do in order to, uh, you know, get uh, ratings from each user on each movie, you know, or even check to see if there is a rating for a user in a movie. Um, that operation, broadly speaking, is on the order of O of n times n, so n times m. Um, and again, that's actually just for one user. So actually, if you want to now generate a prediction for all n users, that now becomes O of n squared times m. So we have this kind of uh, cubic runtime, uh, which is not great. Uh, so if we have a dictionary and we want to go through all the ratings, that operation actually just has a runtime of order uh, O of magnitude of omega here. So this is uh, considerably better runtime if we organize things into dictionaries here. Uh, again, this is not necessarily how you'd want to do this all the time, but for this particular data set, and given the limited compute resources we have, this is actually going to be a little bit better uh, way to do it. So, oh, and then the last thing here, so we're also going to split our data set into sort of a training data set and kind of a validation, dating, a validation data set, because what we want to do is uh, you know, we don't just want to look at our model's error or our model score, model performance, maybe more broadly, just in our training set. Uh, we want to make sure that what the model has learned actually generalizes well beyond the training set. And so when we kind of, you know, see new observations, our model is going to be able to make good, reliable predictions. So that's why we would have this other uh, data set. So... Uh, we want to figure out how many users we have, how many movies we have. Then what we do, in this case, we don't have a sequential data set, so it's perfectly fine for us to shuffle it up. Uh, and in fact, we want to do this to randomize it, and then basically we want to cut it off at the, the first 80% of the observations we'll use to train the algorithm, and then the last 20% we'll do for sort of a validation test to make sure that again that our model still scores well outside of um outside of training all right and then we're going to need to construct a few different dictionaries here uh so we're going to need a user to movie dictionary a movie to user dictionary and then a given a user movie pair we can get a rating and again for both the training set and the test set so uh, the logic for this is actually pretty simple. Um, so this is a function. We're going to define functions to do this. The function considers or takes a row of a data frame. So uh, then we define these kind of index variables, i for the user ID, j for the movie index. Then basically we check to see, is this user ID in the user to movie uh, dictionary? If it isn't, then we add this user movie pair in. And again, we add in the, the value as a list, as a singleton list at first. Uh, if this user already appears in this dictionary, then we go ahead and append the movie to their list of movies uh, that they've given a rating to. Uh, that exact same logic happens in reverse here in the movie to user dictionary. And then we are actually just, it's pretty straightforward to then populate this user movie to rating dictionary uh, by just using the user and movie pair as the key and then populating that with the rating that that user gave to that movie. Uh, then we have to do a simpler function here uh, for the test portion. Uh, we actually will have covered everything that we need in terms of the user to movie and movie to user, but we will need this user movie to rating uh, dictionary for the test set as well. 
So we define this separate function that does that part, and then we apply these functions to the train and test set, uh, respectively, so that uh, so that we have what we need there. All right. Um, then this is a, a sort of another placeholder thing. So ultimately, the data that I'm going to use for the model uh, are going to be these dictionaries. Uh, so again, to make sure I don't have to do all that processing over again, because there was a lot of runtime involved with that, then I actually just save these. I ended up saving them with a .json uh, extension, because they are dictionaries, and JSON is kind of the format you would do that with. But again, these were large enough. It was kind of giving me trouble. So I actually just wrote these as binary. So even though they have a .json extension, these are just binary files. So again, if anything goes wrong later, which it did, uh, the <laughs> I didn't have to do all this work again. Uh, so I can actually just reload those dictionaries and then move on. All right. So now uh, for the actual collaborative filtering part, and this is the part that unfortunately the kernel stopped while this was running. Um, so I'm not sure I'd have to reset it to get it back. So we'll just kind of go over the code, unfortunately. Sorry about that. Um, so basically, we need to make sure we have. Uh, so it turns out all the users are fine. Uh, but where we only have 2,000 movies, there's kind of this chance that we may have some movies in the training set, but not in the test set, or vice versa. So we need to kind of, again, uh, sort of capture exactly what are uh, you know, kind of the uh, number of users and number of movies that we that we have from these dictionaries in case we've reloaded them. Uh, so then what we do to calculate the weights for each user pair, again, using only the 25 most similar neighbors, uh, or more, most similar users. Um, and we also need to make sure that in order for any two users to be considered for each other, that they also have at least five rated movies in common. So we set k to 25, uh, which is how many neighbors uh, we're going to look for. Uh, we have five as the threshold for that we have to have at least that many movies in common. Uh, and then we're going to create these lists for neighbors, averages, and deviations. So now this is the part that's O of n squared times m. So we have uh, for each user. We're going to have to go through and then basically get all of their ratings, their average ratings, uh, their deviations. And then we're going to calculate this, uh, this sigma i. This is the square root of their squared deviations uh, from the denominator of uh, the Pearson correlation that we calculated. So uh, that's all that's happening there. Uh, then we save their average and their deviation. Now for the neighbors part, we're going to use this sorted list. So the sorted list actually keeps things, you know, in order <clears throat> so that we can, you know, if we keep this thing down to only 25, then we know that the 25 things are sort of the, uh, the 25 most, most similar neighbors for user I. So we have user I. We're now going to look through all these other users that we're going to index with J. First, we need to make sure that we're not comparing a user to themselves because that's not useful to do. Uh, so as long as this is not the same user, we're going to actually do all the same stuff for user J. So we're going to look at the movies that they have um, that they've rated. Uh, and then we're going to get the set union of the movies that user I has rated and the movies that user J has rated, so that this is their movies in common. We make sure that movies in common is at least five movies. Uh, and then if, if that's true, then we actually calculate all the stuff for user J that we calculated for user I. So all their ratings, their average ratings, uh, their deviations, and then their the square root of their, the, the sum of square deviations for them. So we calculated all that stuff because that's what we needed ultimately to calculate the weight between these two users, between user I and J. So once we have that, we're going to add that to our sorted list. And I'm negating it because this automatically sorts in ascending order. 
Uh, so this just kind of automatically keeps it in the order that I want. We just have to remember that it's negated later in the code. Uh, then basically, if our sorted list has gotten to be greater than the number of neighbors we want to check, then we just drop the last thing off of that list so that, again, this sorted list is always the 25 nearest neighbors to your user I. So then once we have done that, then for user I, we can actually save their 25 nearest neighbors. So that's essentially what this block of code does is for each user, we go through and we get the weights between that user and their 25 nearest neighbors. Now, uh, we're going to go ahead and define this predict function. So given a user i and a movie m, um, what's our predicted score for this user in this movie? So we start out with just setting our numerator and denominator to 0, because uh, again, we're going to calculate their uh, sort of predicted deviation from their average. Uh, now, we could do this thing where we say, you know, if, um, you know, if these, if these things, uh, or, you know, if, if this movie is in this dictionary for deviations, then look it up. Unfortunately, this is already computationally very expensive, and we would basically then have to kind of go through all the keys in that dictionary to look up you know, whether or not this thing is in there, and then we would need to look it up again if we chose to actually use it. So we want to avoid doing that lookup twice. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to enclose this in this sort of Python code structure where we try to do something. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, then we can kind of gracefully handle the exception. So we're going to try <clears throat> to add this weighted deviation to the numerator and the absolute value of the weight to the denominator. If that works, great. If it doesn't work, uh, which would happen because we you know, don't have this, uh, this movie in, uh, in this dictionary, then basically we just go ahead and return a key error exception. And then we use this pass to mean that we just continue on uh, so that the error doesn't like stop our script, basically. Um, and if it happens somehow that we have the, the denominator still sums up to zero, uh, then we basically just go ahead and predict the user's average rating for their average. Uh, otherwise, we go ahead and uh, predict the weighted average of deviations from their k nearest neighbors, and then uh, add that to their average rating, right? Uh, then this is actually not uncommon to do in like real implementations where you'll again sort of constrain the model output based on some kind of business logic. So in reality, this prediction is sort of unconstrained. This could end up being kind of anything. Um, so if you think that this person, you know, really loves this movie, you might have given them like a six or a seven or whatever. But again, they're supposed to get, you know, ratings on 0.5, this scale of 0.5 to five. So basically, if it's over five, you knock it down to five. If it's below 0.5, you bump it up to 0.5, because that's the range that these uh, ratings have to be on. Um, yeah, um, you actually could possibly in some algorithms or in some situations, make the argument that um, you actually maybe don't want to do this part yet uh, because <clears throat> if you have, say, a movie where someone, you predict that they would give it like a 4.8 and then you have another movie where you predict that they would give it like a 6.5 uh, or well, actually, let's even just say <clears throat> you think they'd give it a 5 and you think the other one they would give a 6.5, um, this logic would actually just make them both 5. So then they're both kind of like equally likely to be recommended. Whereas the second one, you probably should recommend over the first one because we really, really think they would like that one. Um, when I was tinkering with this earlier, though, uh, applying this business logic actually didn't really affect the mean squared error of the model at all. So, uh, I mean, at least not notably, right? Uh, but they, it was always kind of within striking distance, whether I 
did it or didn't. So it uh, turns out that that's, you know, this isn't really hamstringing our model too much at all. And again, whether it's actually kind of hurting your model's performance or not, sometimes business logic is just not optional. So, <laughs> so something to think about as well. Uh, so once we've kind of calculated our prediction, made sure it fits within the range defined by the business, uh, then we go ahead and return our prediction. Uh, and then finally, these last two cells here actually get our uh, predictions on uh, both the training and test set. So yeah, we get, um, in this case, the user, the movie, and then the target, which is actually their rating. Then we get a prediction on what we think this user would give as a rating to movie M. And then where it's a movie that we actually have seen a rating for them for, uh, or we've actually seen this user give a rating, uh, we can see how close our prediction actually was to the target, right? So we save the prediction uh, and the target. And then we do the same thing for the test set. And then ultimately, we have our mean squared error, which is straightforward enough to uh, yeah to calculate. So given we have a list of predictions and a list of targets, we convert these to NumPy arrays so that we can actually have this nice sort of element-wise operation happening to it. So we calculate the difference between the prediction and the target. We square that difference, and then we take the mean to get the mean squared error, uh, and then we print those out. So again, I apologize that we lost the, our, our status on the compute kernel is unknown. So I, I lost the compute kernel uh, the last time I ran this. Um, but when I ran this before, um, I was getting a mean squared error of about uh, 0 0.45 on training and about 0 0.6 on uh, testing, which um, is actually not too far off of the, the current benchmark uh, for this movie lens data set. So I, to be honest, I was a little pleasantly surprised uh, that this very basic statistical algorithm actually performed so well. Uh, again, given that uh, there's so much other stuff out there like autoencoders, restricted Boltzmann machines, um, you know, all, all these crazy deep learning implementations. Uh, interesting that this actually still <laughs> still got so close uh, to to the benchmark uh, on this data set. So yeah, fascinating. I wish that that was still printed out here, <laughs> but uh, it's not, unfortunately. So sorry about that. Okay, um, so that is. Let me go ahead and give this back to Rasha. Um, so that is the demo. Oh, I have to go stop sharing. Yes. Okay. Um, so that's the demo. I know Rasha still has some more stuff to cover, so I will give it back to Rasha. Uh, thank you so much, Jeremy, for taking us through the project demo. And uh, we have gotten quite great questions here in the Q&A box. We'll be taking that in some time. Uh, so let's move on to the uh, program preview. Before that, we would love to know how interested are you in learning the deep recommendation system architecture such as AEs and RBMs? Uh, so I'll quickly launch a poll here. It's a very easy quick poll uh, with three uh, three quick options here. The first one being me, and the second one being I'm in, I'm pretty interested, I guess, and the third one being I'm super interested. I can see the third one getting uh, the highest highest number of votes, and uh, we will be going to the I I, I think a uh, few folks have put down questions on the chat. I'm so sorry, we have gotten a lot of messages while uh, Jeremy was doing the demo, so please. Please uh, go and put down your questions on the Q&A box uh, so Jeremy can have a look as well. OK, OK. Let me quickly end the poll. I can see most of the folks have already shared their responses and share the results. So I can see uh, more than half of the folks are super interested. And also, uh, like um, less than 40% uh, of the folks are pretty much interested. So 4% feeling me. So th I think that's great. Uh, so to see the interest and curiosity in you. So now uh, we would uh, we have covered the project demo and we have talked about uh, machine learning, uh, how you can build a recommend system using machine learning and uh, a lot about other things as well. So uh, we would love to know uh, like what exactly is stopping you from becoming an AIML practitioner? What is your biggest concern here? So you can see a quick poll in the screen before we start the program to your part. So you can see a quick poll on your screen. This is a multiple choice question. So you, if you have multiple concerns, uh, you can select uh, from those options here. 
and uh, this we will get to know what is your biggest concern when it comes to becoming an AIML practitioner. I can see folks have started voting in, and I can see one option getting the highest number of votes. Okay, I'll give five seconds more for a few of the folks who have not shared their biggest concern when it comes to becoming an AIML practitioner. And uh, okay, okay, I think we have gotten most of the votes here. So I'll give five seconds more. So five, four, three, two, one. Let me quickly end the poll and share the results. So as I can see that more than half of the folks have shared that uh, I wouldn't get the practical exposure I need to become job ready, being their biggest concern. And uh, I can see uh, few of the folks have shared I can't find a fully comprehensive curriculum. And uh, and few of the folks have shared my work skill would allow me in a frame for learning. And some of the folks have also shared that I find it difficult to learn from pre development videos. So thank you so much for sharing your biggest concern. Now, moving on to the program. So Caltech's Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Bootcamp uh, gives you a comprehensive and industry aligned curriculum. And uh, we cover many such projects like this uh, in this program as well, which we'll be talking about in the upcoming slides. You have access to hands-on labs and projects and all online virtual classrooms. And this particular program is very flexible in terms of uh, basically, if you are working somewhere, if you basically are managing a part-time or full-time job, so you can basically co easily complete this program by just giving 10 to 15 hours per week. And this program duration is of six months. And at the end of it all, you will be getting a Caltech CTME Bootcamp Certificate of AI and Machine Learning Bootcamp, and also core and elective uh, course certificates as well. You will be get, getting up to 20, 22 CEUs. That is, that is equal to 220 hours of learning. Okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry, I was taking the chat. Uh, so, and, and a Caltech CTMA membership as well, uh, in which you get to be a part of a diverse alumni from different different uh, parts of industries and the different different parts profiles they come from, and also uh, an online convocation where not just your close family but your friends and relatives can also join your convocation. So that's pretty interesting. Now the eligibility. I think someone asked about the eligibility as well. So you need to have a prior experience in. Uh, or knowledge in mathematics and programming and a high school diploma uh, and or equivalent at age of uh, 18 years of age and two or more, year, or more years of experience is required, uh, not mandatory. Now moving on to how this program basically prepares you. So uh, Jeremy, can you take us through the uh, steps of uh, basically how this program builds your AIML skills? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So. Um... Yeah, so again, start with an orientation session and get sort of an introduction to artificial intelligence in the beginning. Uh, this, as I understand, that is actually quite surface level. Uh, I actually haven't taught those earlier classes. So I'm, uh, as I understand it, they're, they're a pretty gentle introduction. Um, then we get into the applied data science with Python, uh, where we talk kind of more about not so much the machine learning yet in depth, in that class, uh, but we do talk a lot about kind of the life cycle of implementing these projects in industry. Uh, what are the sort of the practical considerations that have to be made? Um, things like cleaning the data, processing the data, stuff that we saw uh, kind of in the demo today. Uh, so we cover examples of that. Uh, things like imputing missing values, dealing with outliers. Uh, all of that kind of stuff. So, uh, and a lot of kind of analyzing the data to get insights, uh, kind of prepare yourself for the exercise of making a model, because that's often the end goal of what we do. Um, then we get into the machine learning. And so in the machine learning class, we actually get into, I would say, more classical machine learning algorithms. So things like naive Bayes classifiers, um, k-nearest neighbors. We get into like tree-based algorithms, like decision trees and random forest. Um, we do talk about th things like linear regression and logistic regression, which are tragically underrated. Uh, in fact, they're actually sort of the basis of deep learning. So you have to make sure you understand those two algorithms very, very well if you want to understand deep learning. Uh, they also are the basis of time series modeling and time series analysis, which we also get into. Um, so yeah, we, we cover uh, kind of good smattering, a, a good sort of broad uh, bit of topics in machine learning in that class. Then we move on to deep learning with Keras and TensorFlow. And that's where we actually take what we started in the machine learning class, the 
things that like uh, linear regression and logistic regression. We ultimately extend those ideas into feed forward artificial neural networks, which is the beginning really of deep learning. Um, then we learn about uh, how do we expand this feed forward architecture to do different things like convolutional neural networks um, for things like computer vision, um, things like recurrent neural networks for sequences. Um, and we actually do get into autoencoders. So we mentioned autoencoders as a thing that happens for uh, recommender systems. Uh, we do talk about autoencoders in that class as well. Um, and there we also cover uh, specific frameworks for how you implement this stuff. So things like TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, um, although PyTorch is really only touched on just a bit. Uh, but yeah, TensorFlow and, and Keras actually, which is a very nice sort of front end for TensorFlow that makes it uh, much nicer to get into. Um, then we get into, yeah, the advanced deep learning uh, and computer vision. So that is going to focus very, very much more on things like the convolutional neural network architecture and how that applies to computer vision, um, what that specifically does for you, like what are the advantages? I know we're pressed for time, so I won't, I'm tempted to tell you about it, but I won't. Um, and then finally, uh, you have this uh, capstone project uh, where you kind of take everything that you've learned, uh, put it all together in one big project. That's actually something you can put on your resume and demonstrate to hiring managers uh, that you have this sort of hands-on experience and knowledge to execute this stuff in the real world. Um, and then you get your certificate. Uh, thank you so much, Jeremy, for taking us to the steps. Uh, also, about the electives, they are optional. They come as a part of the program, so you don't have to pay anything extra for those. Uh, so moving on, uh, what sk uh, skills do you need in order to become an AIML practitioner? So as we can see, there are foundational skills, learning methods, and for advanced topics. Jeremy, can you quickly take us through uh, these uh, skills? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah, so this is statistics and math. Um, so aside from statistics and probability, what you'll need in the mathematics area is um, linear algebra, absolutely. Uh, and I would say vector calculus uh, as well so that we can calculate uh, gradients in higher dimensional spaces. That's ultimately something that we need to do to optimize these models or to fit them to data. Um, yeah, and then the programming piece, right, to actually implement this stuff. So Python and its various libraries, such as the NumPy stack. Um, yeah, then we do cover a variety of learning methods. So supervised and unsupervised uh, learning, reinforcement learning. Um, recommender systems like we just covered, and then ensemble learning, which is actually really powerful, one of my favorite things, where you're actually combining multiple models to make one prediction, um, kind of making use of uh, this uh, <clears throat> this knowledge of, uh, sort of the, the, this wisdom of crowds principle, right? That crowds actually are often kind of more wise than individuals in making, making guesses or predictions about stuff. Um, and then, yeah, and finally, at the end, we get to the advanced topics, which is the deep learning framework, such as Keras and TensorFlow, and then um, the things that that's actually used for, right? So building neural networks, um, generative adversarial networks, or GANs, uh, and actually some other topics in generative AI, just period, uh, which is a hot topic these days, uh, and then computer vision and NLP, which again, very much feeds into sort of the generative AI craze, right? So like large language models like GPT, that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, all, all that gets covered to some degree. Um, thank you so much, Jeremy, for taking us through that. Uh, also the tools and platforms you'll be learning in this program, uh, some of them being Python, Django, Keras, and uh, Mat Matlab, and TensorFlow, OpenCV, and many more like this. Uh, we covered a project here uh, for one of the industry aligned projects, which you'll be getting to uh, basically uh, complete for your portfolio through this program. Uh, some of them you can see on the screen uh, for entertainment, e-commerce, tourism, real estate, healthcare, and many more like this, and uh, very similar to the project, project we, uh, demonstration we covered in this webinar as well. Uh, also, a capstone project which you can showcase to your future employees. Uh, through this capstone project, you basically can capture two experiences which uh, you can showcase in your portfolio, uh, a real-life business scenario. And uh, we have global leaders as program advisors, Rick Hefner, who basically make sure that Sibley Learn is delivering up to uh, Caltech standard. 
Uh, also, you get discipline on career as a services help uh, where you get free access to expert webinars, real world projects across industries, and job as a services, which I'll be talking about next. The job as a services uh, uh, in this, we have partnered with Talent Inc. In this, you get access to job portal resume rabbit and a resume review and rewrite services by top resume and also one on one interview services from top interview. So, and the enrollment and the program schedule uh, of this uh, program is the, uh, the fee for this is $9,999. Nine, $9, and also we have financing option of labels for $80 per month. Uh, in case you have any questions, you can always reach out to us at ask.net. I'll be sharing that uh, on chat here. So we would love to know that, would you like to enroll into the AIML uh, bootcamp? You can see a quick polar screen here. Please share your interest towards enrollment of the, into the program. Uh, before we move on to the Q&A part of the webinar. So we have gotten great questions there. And uh, so sorry if you were not able to answer it initially. So you can see a quick poll on your screen here. Uh, so are you interested in enrolling to the Caltech's AIML Bootcamp? So you can just uh, quickly submit your interest by clicking on the yes or no option on the poll. And uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, by the way, Jeremy, that uh, whiteboard idea was pretty interesting. You know, it gave like an old school kind of uh, classroom feel. So we don't usually get the, that that on webinars. So that was a really good idea, I think. So, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's how I uh, that's how I do it in my classes that I teach. Which actually, Al Alex is one of my students. He's in the chat, so he'll he can <laughs> he can confirm for you. That's a uh, <laughs> that's a thing I like to do. Nice. Okay, I'll I'll just uh, keep up the poll for ten seconds more. I can see most of the folks have shared their interest towards enrollment, and we'll be moving on to the Q and A part after this. I'll I'll share the schedule, upcoming schedule level. I think someone on the Q and A have asked about if there is a deadline to register and join the course. I'll share that in the upcoming slides. So I'll give five seconds more for the poll. So folks who have not shared their interest towards enrollment, if you are interested in enrolling to the AML bootcamp. By Caltech, please do let us know on the quick poll you see on the screen. So I think I'll just close the poll in five seconds of five. Still moving. Okay, guys, be quick. We have extended the webinar. Uh, so number. So you'll get you'll be getting to see that. If you have a special request, you can let us know on chat or in the post webinar survey. Please do that. Okay, I think uh, uh, we have most of the folks have voted uh, for the polls. So I'll be closing the poll now. Thank you so much, folks, for voting. And uh, let's move on now to the enrollment step. So we have very uh, quick, three easy, simple steps uh, you need to follow in order to enroll. You need to you need to submit an application. You can start at ask us at .net. I'll share the email ID uh, after this. And uh, once you have submitted your application, your application will go for review. And based on the review, you'll be getting an admissions offer letter from uh, Simply Learn. And also a learning consultant will be reaching out to you uh, post that. And the upcoming uh, cohort for this program is on our 9th of October. And the classes will also be starting from 9th October. So if uh, someone has asked for registering and joining the course, this is the upcoming cohort we have for this program. And now we would love to know that how soon are you planning to join the Caltech AIMA Bootcamp? So you can see four week options on the screen. Uh, folks who have shared their interest to this enrollment, I will highly recommend to let us know. When exactly are you trying to enroll? This will give us a better idea, right? When to reach out to you as well. And also, we would not want you to uh, basically lose out on the bonus offer you'll be getting for attending this webinar. And also, patiently staying till the end as well. So that's a big bonus to have, you know. So please don't lose out on the bonus. In case uh, you are still thinking about it, I would suggest to take at least within six months or more than six months from now, if you're not starting immediately. So at least you will have that bonus offer, right? Which you can apply when you start. I can see folks have started sharing when they when do they want to enroll. That's great. Uh, we'll be moving on to the Q&A part after this. So if you have not shared your query or question uh, on the Q&A box, please do that immediately because we'll be moving that to that pretty soon. Okay, I'll just uh, give five seconds more for the poll. So let us know how soon do you plan to enroll. Immediately, within three months, within six months, more than six months from now, which is the most suitable option for you. Okay, I think we have got most of the votes from the folks here. Thank you for sharing that. I'll be ending the poll now. And now, let's move on, move on to the Q&A part of the webinar. 
So uh, let me just quickly browse through it. I think uh, we have gotten a very, I think we've gotten a question during the project demo. Okay. What platform do you use to build this, Jeremy? Uh, <clears throat> that's a very good question. So um, it depends on what you mean by platform. Um, so anything that I've done in machine learning for as long as I can remember has been in Python. You can do it in other languages. Uh, Python actually, though, just makes it really, really easy. Um, so, yeah, sometimes I'll actually do a lot of like data analysis and visualization in R. I still like R quite a bit for that. Um, but uh, yeah, ultimately I build stuff in Python and depending on what it is, I might just use NumPy, um, you know, especially if it's literally just like a bunch of matrix calculations, I'll just do it in NumPy. Uh, but I have used scikit-learn, um, statsmodels.api, and for a lot of uh, deep learning stuff, uh, I use TensorFlow, uh, for everything. Uh, I, I know I actually have some friends that are really, really big on PyTorch. Um, I think it's interesting. I actually have kind of wanted to check out PyTorch more. Um, but honestly, still, uh, I would say if you want to actually put something in production, uh, it's got to be TensorFlow. TensorFlow is like by far the most performant deep learning uh, framework that there is out there. Um, and then in terms of how you actually deploy this stuff, um, that also depends on how the model is going to be used. So sometimes your model is like going to give like answers on everything in the data and that's needed like periodically. Um, in that case, you would just set that up on uh, sort of a scheduled task or a, a cron, uh, sort of the parlance in like Linux based systems, which is usually what you use. Um, so you just have this scheduled job that runs your model every day, every week, whatever. And then it'll usually just outwrite its, or write out its answer to a table. Um, for more kind of real time uh, model implementations where you need the answer kind of, again, a little more ad hoc or one off. Uh, I use Flask a lot uh, to build the API that the model sits in. Uh, that gets containerized with Docker. Uh, and then ultimately where the Docker image goes kind of depends on, you know, what, they, what they've decided on for the architecture, so. Uh, thank you so much, Jeremy, for answering that. I hope you answer, answer your question. Please do let us know in chat. Uh, we have gotten another interesting question. Um, I can't get the name, uh, but I am an RN by profession and would like to know what applications in healthcare and or EHR, EMR, spe specifically uh, Epic system does AIML have as growth areas in coming years? Uh, let's see. I should pull up the Q&A so I can see. Uh, so I am an RN by profession. I would like to know what... Uh, so there are actually lots. I've done quite a bit of consulting in healthcare. Uh, my wife is an RN as well. Um, I don't really know exactly what you specifically would do as a registered nurse with AI, but I imagine that there are going to be a lot of things that augment uh, patient care uh, for RNs and for physicians and other practitioners in the near future. Uh, things like uh, augmented reality, uh, assisted by a machine learning model, but again, we're ultimately probably still going to leave that up to real people for a while, <laughs> at least. Uh, so yeah, I think there are lots and lots and lots and lots of things there. You could even use like survival modeling to predict length of stay, right? Like what's the patient's prognosis? So like once they've come into the hospital, given their say diagnosis related group, um, how long do we ex expect them to be in the hospital or say they present to the ER um, and then they ultimately need to be discharged or admitted? How long do we think it'll take given, you know, a number of factors, how busy the ER is, what their diagnosis related group is at triage, all that kind of stuff. I think there are a lot of different interesting modeling applications for that particular field. Uh, thank you so much for answering that, Jeremy. I hope that answers your question. Uh, I think that is the last question we'll be taking uh, now. Uh, maybe Jeremy can look through if any of the questions which are not answered. Uh, now, moving uh, to the last poll of the session. So uh, for folks who have shared their interest to in enrollment and also shared with us, when do you plan to enroll? Uh, so do you need an assistance in enrollment, enrollment to the program? So you can let us know in the quick poll you see on your screen right now. So do you need help? Do you need assistance when you're trying to enroll into the program? So you can quickly just let us know by the quick poll on you see on your screen right now. I would say take the extra help. You're getting the extra help. 
ask uh, questions you have about the program and before taking that up. Okay, I'll just uh, keep this poll for 10 seconds more. Okay, so uh, in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you so much for sharing. If you need assistance in tolling the program, so now we're towards the end of the session. Uh, thank you so much, Jeremy, for taking this time out and even extending the time as you know for the project demo as required. Uh, would you like to say something to the audience before we end the session? Um, yeah, just thank you so much, everybody, for sticking with me. Uh, I know that my <laughs> I can sometimes be a little long-winded, so we went a little bit over time, but you guys, most of you have uh, stuck it out and are hanging with us even still, so we really appreciate that, and I uh, hope to see you all in the program. Thank you so much, folks, for joining. I'll just uh, share the program link here as well. Meanwhile, you can share uh, how, you, how was the webinar for you on the chat here. And also you can share with the suggestion of the post webinar survey as well. So I'll just uh, share the program link here on chat in case you want to look to the uh, program in much more detail. So I've shared that on chat. Thank you so much. I can see folks are responding on chat here. So, uh, okay, it was a great session. So, okay, I think someone has asked you a question. You can answer okay. their question over the email. <laughs> I think uh, it's related to something else. So that's okay. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you so much, Steve. <laughs> Good job, Russia. Okay, fine. We'll end, end the webinar now. And we'll be coming up with such more webinars with Jeremy. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And uh, have a good night, good evening, good morning, wherever you're joining from. Thank you so much, folks.